church. Well, this is the beginning of Holy Week. It starts with Palm Sunday and it goes to Easter. And today we are wrapping up the study that we've had in the book of Esther. And we're also connecting it to what is one of the kind of historic days on the Christian calendar, if you will, Palm Sunday. It's been super fun studying the life of this remarkable woman and how she discovered to walk into who God had made her to be. And as she does, it changes the world around her. And we saw that last week. Today, we're going to look at the aftermath of what happened at the end of the book of Esther, or what happens at the end, and then also talk about Jesus and Palm Sunday, because this is really a day of celebration. And there's a lot of things in common with Palm Sunday and what we're gonna talk about today at the end of the book of Esther. This is really a day of celebration. It's a day of joy. Um, I've always loved Palm Sunday as I've grown up and kind of been around in church and been a pastor. There's just always so much uh, excitement and celebration and that's matching the tone of what happened at the original Palm Sunday. But let's start in the book of Esther and then we'll get to Palm Sunday. Um, we're gonna be looking at the chapters eight, nine, and 10 today, just kind of like overview through them. Because as we saw last week, Esther, she tells the king that she's actually a Jew, that Haman is trying to kill all of the Jews. And then he's discovered for who he actually is. The king has him killed. Mordecai, Esther's uncle, is elevated and honor, honored. And um, that's all great. You ever feel like you got to the end of something and you're like, this is awesome. I can kind of kick back and relax now. But there's still actually a little bit more to do. Well, that's what's happening here in Esther because there's a few things that need to get wrapped up. If you didn't remember, the whole reason that Esther and Mordecai were scared to death, literally, is because all of the Jews were getting ready to get killed. And there was an edict that had gone out from the king under the influence of Haman saying the day that all the Jews were going to be annihilated. And so that edict is still in place. So even though Haman's been killed, the big bad guy has been taken out, 
his edict is still around. And so Esther goes back to the king in chapter eight, and now she doesn't have an issue going and talking to him anymore. She's like bold as all get out. She's going to him like several times asking him for things. And so she's saying, hey, what do we do now? This edict is still in place. My people are gonna be killed. And the king, he's like, well, I'm sorry, I can't do anything about it. Um, that was sealed with my ring. And the custom of the Medes and Persians is that once an edict goes out from the king, it can't be undone. But there are creative ways to think about this. And so they come up with a plan where Mordecai has this idea that the Jews are allowed to defend themselves. So it's not like the extinction or the execution of all the Jews is off, but they are allowed to fight back against the people that are trying to kill them. So it's kind of like a Ukraine situation. Like we can't go in and fight for you, but we can supply you with everything you need so that you can defend yourself. And that's what's happening here. So they send out this information to all of the land as fast as they can. So they're probably using like UPS because they definitely weren't using the postal service. Definitely wasn't FedEx. I, have you ever had like a bad shipping experience with FedEx? Uh, I can't even tell you about some of the bad shipping experiences I've had. But anyway, they had to use somebody reliable. They had to get the word out. So they're probably going brown. They're going with UPS. And they're getting the information to all the people. All the Jews get the news. They stand up. They defend themselves. And in Esther chapter 9, it says, Meanwhile, the remainder of the Jews, this is verse 16, who were in the king's provinces also assembled to protect themselves and get relief from their enemies. They killed 75,000 of them, but did not lay their hands on the plunder. So the Jews stood up, they fought, and they were victorious. They killed 75,000 people that were coming to attack them. Now, this wasn't like them committing genocide. These were people trying to actively kill them, and they were defending themselves, and they were able to destroy the people who were trying to destroy them. And so because of this monumentous victory, they decide to have a big party. In verse 20, it says, Mordecai recorded these things and sent letters to all the Jews who were in all the provinces of King Ahasuerus, both near and far, obliging them to keep the 14th day of the month, Adar, and also the 15th day of the same, year by year, as the days on which the Jews got relief from their enemies." And as the month that had been turned for them from sorrow and gladness, sorry, sorry, sorrow into gladness and from mourning into a holiday, that they should make them days of feasting and gladness, days for sending gifts of food to one another and gifts to the poor. So instead of all of the Jews getting killed, they're having a party and they're celebrating because they were now able to stay alive. So they commemorated this day and they called it the Feast of Purim, the Feast of Purim. And the Jews today still celebrate Purim. In fact, right before we began the book of Esther and studying it, the day before was the Feast of Purim. Jews still celebrate it today. And this is not uncommon. We do similar kinds of things in our day and age. There's special days that we want to kind of mark on the calendar and remember. Some of them might be moments of great excitement. Some of them might be more serious, somber days that, that we want to commemorate, like 9-11 like or something like that. Or there can be days of celebration that we make into holidays, like Juneteenth, June 19th, um, which is the day that the final, like the last slaves got the information that they were actually freed, even though the end of the Civil War had happened previously and all the slaves had been emancipated, not all of them got the information until June 19th. And so we've made that into a federal holiday or President's Day to remember the birthdays of Washington and Lincoln or MLK Day. So they commemorated this day. They made it a feast, the Feast of Purim. And I've called today's message, just as a long lead in, from Purim to Passover, from Purim to Passover. So Holy Week starts on Palm Sunday. Then as you go throughout the week, you get to Good Friday, which is Passover, and then you get to 
Resurrection Sunday, which is Easter. And so Holy Week has all of these different kind of markers that we remember. Palm Sunday is where it all began when Jesus marched into, was paraded into Jerusalem on a donkey and everybody worshiped him and celebrated him. And you can read those stories in all four gospels. It's one of those stories that makes its way into every gospel. And it was a big day of celebration, probably felt similar to the Feast of Purim where people are excited and they're rejoicing and they're having a great time. And they're, you know, at the Feast of Purim, they're exchanging gifts. They're so excited. That was the kind of feeling on Palm Sunday. It was one of jubilation and joy. But then just a few days later, Jesus would be crucified. And before he's crucified, he has a meal with his disciples, the Passover meal. And the Passover meal was another ancient Jewish holiday. It was a a time where they were intended to remember how they had been slaves in Egypt and God had come and visited them miraculously. And after 10 plagues that had been enacted upon the Egyptians, they were freed and allowed to leave Egypt and start their own country with their own people and go into the promised land. And the day that it happened, God had warned the Israelites that there was going to be an angel passing over all of Egypt. And anyone who did not have the blood of a lamb on the doorposts of their house, inside of those houses where that wasn't the case, the firstborn of every child and every animal would die. And so this was like a last ditch effort kind of from God because Pharaoh's heart had been so hard that even though nine plagues had happened before this, he was, he would not relent and let the Israelites go. And so this was like this last thing that God did to, to get Pharaoh to relent. And the Jews put the blood of the lamb on the doorposts of their houses and it kept them safe from the judgment as the angel passed over. And so the Jews left kind of in a hurry because the Egyptians were at that point just like, leave, get out of here. And so they had to take bread with them that hadn't even been fully cooked or fully baked. And that's why still today on Passover, the Jews eat unleavened bread. It was a a reminder of them how they had to quickly leave the exodus from, from Egypt. And so the Passover was a big celebration of the day that God freed the Israelites from their bondage. So you can see how there's similarities between Purim and Passover. Because Purim was a day where all of the Israelites were slated for execution. And if nothing changed, they would just be lambs led to the slaughter. And they were defenseless and hopeless until God used Esther and Mordecai to get the king's attention and enable them to defend themselves. And so Both of these days are days of really great joy. Passover was something that Israel would always point back to because it's really the day that everything changed for them. And still today, Jews are observing Purim, they're observing Passover. We as Christians in the middle of that remember some of these holidays as well. It's really good, I think, when God does something really significant and powerful in our lives that that we make sure we remember it. And if that means that we write it down or that we we, uh, make a day even in our family where we like every year we look back and we remember this, this is the day. This is the day that we were on the verge of bankruptcy and God miraculously came through. This is the day that I gave my life to Christ and it changed forever. This is the day when, when God at the last minute came through and my mom got healed of cancer. This is the day, like remembering things because when you remember, you don't forget. I know that sounds so obvious, right? But, but the, the thing is, if you don't actively choose to remember, you will just inevitably forget. And so putting days on the calendar to remind yourself of what God has done is gonna fill you up with faith for the future of what he's going to do. Which is why I would encourage you to take notes in church. Because 
you're saying through that, it's like, I know God's going to speak to me today and, and I don't want to forget it. I want to write it down so that I can remember what he said. So when God does something significant in your life, it is appropriate to commemorate it and to remember it and to celebrate it. And that's what the Jews did here. Passover was so uh, a picture of what Jesus actually did for us ultimately at the cross. Because through his sacrifice, when he willingly laid down his life, he freed us and he liberated us from the bondage and the captivity that we were in to sin. He led us out of the land of bondage and brought us into a place that we could call home. He changed our destinies. He, he rewrote history for us and he gave us a fresh start and a new beginning. And we need to remember that. We, we need to actively choose to remember what God has done for us. And, and to not forget there was a time when we lived in Egypt. There was a time when we were slaves to our sin. There was a time when we were under the oppression of people and things that, that were holding us back from what God had for us. And then Jesus came and he liberated us and he brought us into a new life and he gave us a new beginning and a new start. It was our Passover. It's what Jesus did for us at the cross. It's when we started following him. You see, there's a lot of similarities between these two holidays. I've already mentioned some, but one of them is just remembering that God has defeated your enemies. It's interesting, Haman is taken out, right? He's hanged. And you might think, well, this is all good. You know, it's done. Like Haman's been killed. And so what is there to worry about? But there was still a battle to fight. There was still a war to be won. And the same was true for the Israelites when they were released from Egypt. Yes, they were released from Egypt, but then they would go to the promised land and the promised land was actually occupied by other people and they had to go in. And even though God had guaranteed them that this was going to be their land, they still had to fight for it. You see, when God saves you, when he delivers you, he has a plan and a purpose for you and it's yours to walk into and it's guaranteed what he wants to give to you. Like it's promised if you will walk into it that it will be yours, but you have to fight for it. There's a part that you play in this. You can't just kick back and be like, well, God delivered me, so I'm good. Everything that he wants me to do, I'm sure it's just gonna happen. I'm not gonna have to do anything other than just sit back and relax and watch him do all the work. No, you have a part to play. The victory is yours, but you have to fight for it. That's what happened here in Esther. The victory was theirs, but they had to defend themselves. And God has given you weapons to defend yourself with. If you read in the book of Ephesians, it lays out that there are these items that God has us um, wage war with. They're called the armor of God. I don't know if you ever like saw this maybe as a kid. I used to work at a Christian bookstore and we, we actually sold armor of God kits and kids could have the armor of God that they would go around. And listen, that's not, like the armor of God is, it's not a physical armor because it's not a physical battle. It's a spiritual battle. The Bible also says that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but are spiritual for taking down strongholds. You see, we're in a spiritual battle. It's an unseen world. And in order to fight in that world, we have to take up the weapons of the spirit. Things like prayer, things like reading God's word, things like believing what God has said. And so each different piece of the armor has something to do with that. There's the, the breastplate of righteousness. There's the shield of faith. There's the belt of truth. There's the helmet of salvation. There's the sword of the spirit. Read all the pieces sometimes and get familiar with them because you're in a battle. And even though the victory is yours, you still have to fight for it. The devil's still gonna attack you even though you're a child of God. In fact, he's gonna attack you even more. And so you have to even more take up the truth that God says about you and about the world. And that's why you need to have this helmet of salvation on. That's why you need to know God's word 
so that you can fight with the sword of the Spirit. The victory is yours. It's guaranteed, but you have to defend yourself. And then we're meant to fight not against people, but for people. God doesn't want us to advance his kingdom by force. God wants us to advance his kingdom on our knees. We, we win the battle when we let God do the fighting as we pray to him and engage in the warfare of the spirit. God wants us to be geared up, ready for the enemy's attacks, and then we go into this world not ready to fight against people, but to fight for people. We fight by loving people. We fight by serving people. We win the war by turning our enemies into our friends. We win the war by making our adversaries into our allies. And we do this the same way that Jesus won the battle to win us. He laid down his life and he served us. And through that, he destroyed all the things that were coming against us and won us over to him. I think there's a lot of Christians who have a misconception of this. They get it wrong. They think like, okay, what's the latest thing that we've got to fight? All right, is it Disney? Okay, we're against Disney now. All right, get, everybody get your, like, get your fists up. Get ready to fight. It's us versus Disney. Listen, it's not you versus Disney. It's not you versus anybody. It's God's kingdom versus the devil's kingdom. It's, it's you versus the enemy, not people. And, and the way that you're going to win the people over that have different beliefs than you is not by going and attacking them, but it's by loving them. Like, of course, people who don't believe in Jesus are going to act like they don't believe in Jesus. That's, that's like, that makes sense. We're the ones that are weird. Like, we believe in Jesus. It's changed our whole perspective, and that's why we view the world the way that we do. We can't expect people who don't share that belief to have the same worldview as we do. And so that's why we go out and we fight this battle with love. Because the weapons of our warfare aren't carnal, but they're spiritual. So we're in this battle. We've been given the right to defend ourselves. The victory is ours. And God has great things for us to walk into, but we still have to choose to walk into them. So fast forward thousands of years and let's remember Palm Sunday. Between Passover and Purim, is Palm Sunday. And Jesus marches in, or he's paraded in to Jerusalem. People are worshiping him. People are shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They're throwing palm branches on the ground as a way to kind of pave the way for him. It was like a, a big parade. This is actually what they would do for armies, or for emperors or kings or generals who would come back from battle who had been victorious and they would celebrate them and worship them. Think of like the Los Angeles Rams coming back home after the Super Bowl and everybody, there's a big parade, they're on the bus and there's confetti everywhere and people are excited. Just this last week, my favorite team, the Jayhawks, they won the national championship in the NCAA men's basketball tournament. I'm sure in Lawrence, Kansas, there's celebration, there's gonna be a parade. And so that was the idea here is that Jesus came in and people worshiped him. And this was a really awesome moment. But it wasn't as awesome as it could have been. Because what happened is there was kind of, people had been worked into a frenzy and they were excited and they were worshiping him because it couldn't have gone another way because he was the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And this was the moment that had been prophesied about that he would come on a donkey into Jerusalem. And so like this just had to happen, but people didn't really understand what was happening. They were caught up in a moment, but they didn't actually know who Jesus was. 
And that's why a few days later, those same people would crucify him. And I wonder today how many of us have gotten caught up in a moment. Maybe we've been at church on the weekends and we're cheering Jesus on and we're saying he's the best. And we're worshiping him loud. But then when you go throughout our lives, we're actually doing things that are more in line with the people who crucified him than what it looks like for the people who should be living for him. And so sometimes we don't get it and we make a big deal out of holidays, which I said, hey, it's great. We should commemorate the things that God's done in our lives. But sometimes we make such a big deal of Easter and of Christmas and we like put these on the calendar. We make sure that we you know, do the right religious things at those times, but then we live the rest of our lives in between those Sundays like God isn't even real. And so God wants us to move from this moment of just spending one second, one Sunday, two Sundays a year worshiping him to this lifestyle of celebrating him. The Puritans, who were uh, followers of Christ kind of in the 1600s, they actually refused to celebrate these holidays. And, you know, some people still do. I, I think these holidays are great. But, but the reason that they did is interesting. They refused to celebrate these holidays because they said, every Sunday is Resurrection Sunday for us. Every Sunday is Thanksgiving for us. Every Sunday we remember that Jesus came to earth as a baby and grew up and he died for us. And so we don't need to make these certain special days. We remember it all year long. And while there's nothing wrong with celebrating special occasions, and I love them, if we're only doing that, we're missing the point. Every weekend is a celebration. Every weekend is Palm Sunday. Every weekend is Purim. Every weekend is Passover. We remember that Jesus lived and died and gave his life and gave us freedom and marched us out of Egypt into the promised land and we're living like that's true every week. And yes, we're stumbling and we're struggling and none of us are perfect and, and the church is not a museum for saints, it's a hospital for sinners. So we're bringing people in who don't know this story or they're living on the outside of it and they could be living with a sense of purpose and destiny and their lives could be changed. And we're bringing people into this with us. And on Sundays, we have a mixed crowd of people who are in all different places in their spiritual journey, but we're on the path together to follow Jesus. And so, yes, we are gonna celebrate Palm Sunday and I hope you got to join us in worship or you're here even in person with us this weekend and we're celebrating and it's exciting and we're singing loud and we're proclaiming loud who Jesus is. And then throughout the week, we want to do that as well. That's why the, in the Feast of Purim, they, uh, they actually would send gifts to each other and gifts to the poor. And one thing that we're doing today is we're starting a partnership with New Day who distributes food to those who are hungry in our city. And so we have a sign up opportunity for you if you would like to be one of the people that gets the notification about where food needs to be delivered. And then we actually purchase the groceries, deliver them to the people. New Day is like, we'll reimburse you actually for the groceries. So they're just looking for somebody to go get it and give it to the people in need. And we can be a conduit of God's provision for people in our city because we're remembering what he did for us and we're wanting to pass it on to others and we're celebrating and giving gifts to the poor. And so there's gonna be a sign-up that pops up on the screen and if you're here in person, we're gonna have a sign-up that you can use in the back of the room, but we don't want to just be a dead end for God's grace. We wanna be a conduit through which his grace can flow to other people and to our city. So I can't wait for next Sunday. It's Resurrection Sunday. It's the day we remember that Jesus rose from the dead and it gives us so much hope and it's changed our lives because it means anything is possible and it means that, that God can bring dead things back to life. Not just dead people, but dead things. Things that you feel like could never come alive again 
things that you think the time has gone for those, that, that they could never have life again, they could never have breath again. God can bring it to life. God can take that relationship that is done for and he can resurrect it. God can take that job that you think is at its end and he can sustain it. God can bring people in your life who you think are so far from him into a relationship with him. Nothing is impossible with God because he is alive and he rose from the dead and we're gonna celebrate it next weekend. If you think that Harry Potter just happened to have the ending it did because J.K. Rowling is some brilliant author. No, where did she get it from? She got it from the Bible, y'all. Harry willingly gave up his life and then he could take it back. It's straight stolen from scripture. So Jesus has defeated Voldemort. Jesus has defeated the grave. And Jesus can defeat whatever is troubling you right now. So on this Palm Sunday, I think the best thing that you and I could do is give people an opportunity to come into a relationship with Jesus and get to know him for who he actually is and see him change their life. Would you pray with me? God, thank you for this encouraging message from your word. Thank you for uh, those that are watching this Sunday. I pray, God, you would draw people into a relationship with you that would change their lives forever and that would give them a fresh start. And if you'd like to do that today, I just want you to raise your hand in the chat to let us know that you wanna commit your life to Jesus. And we would like to come alongside you and encourage you in that. So please let us know. Awesome. We're so thankful for each person doing that today. Hey, we're going to let you know about some things coming up here at Cross and Anchor that you can be a part of. So stay tuned for that. We love you so much. We'll see you next weekend. Have a great Sunday. What's up, Cross and Anchor family? I'm Rob, and I know you enjoyed that amazing message from Pastor Josh. So grateful for God's word. Look, I wanted to let you know about some exciting things that's coming up in our church. If you've been watching the news or you're on social media, you know that we are living in a crazy, crazy world right now. But we have a hope in Jesus. And next Sunday, we're going to be celebrating why we have that hope. It is Easter Sunday. Look, it is like the Christian Super Bowl. It's going to be incredible. We all know that there's never a bad time to be in the house of God. But I mean, who wouldn't want to be there for a Christian Super Bowl, right? So we want you guys to invite your friends, invite your family. We want to see you there. Invite, invite, invite. It's going to be incredible. And leading up to Easter, we're going to be having a very special worship night service on Good Friday. It's going to be at 8 fold at 6 p.m. We're going to be worshiping God for his sacrifice and his love for us. Look, we love God because he first loved us. So let's give worship and praise where praise is due. It's going to be an amazing time. So we want to see you there as well. Again, that's going to be at 8 fold at 6 p.m. Guys, right before that, we're going to be having dinner parties on Wednesday. We have dinner parties every single Wednesday at 7 p.m. It's an amazing opportunity for you to be in fellowship and in community with other believers where we can sharpen and grow in our faith. The word tells us that iron sharpens iron. So you want to be amongst people who can help you grow in the areas that you desire to grow in. So let's do life together. Meet us on Wednesday at 7 p.m. at a dinner party. You can DM us for information to let you know we have a couple of options where you can go. It's going to be incredible as well. So we're coming to the end of our service. But before we go, I just want to give you an opportunity to sow a seed into this ministry. God is doing some an amazing, amazing things through Cross and Anchor. And we are so just proud and just grateful to be a vessel to what God is doing. Look, it's because of your generosity and generosity of people just like you that we are able to advance his kingdom and share the hope of Jesus. Lives are being changed. Hope is being found because of people like you who are helping 
advance this mission. So if you would like to continue to sow a seed into this ministry so we could continue to share the hope of Jesus to lives in this city and beyond, all the ways to give are here on the screen. So I hope you guys enjoyed this service. We love you. Until we meet again, know that you are loved. God bless you guys. See you next week.